So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Top Tog session. Hi, Terry. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Jay. How are you? I'm very good, mate. So we've had our trials and tribulations with testing today and everything. Fingers crossed now is good to go. So, uh, I well, know we've never know <laughs> <laughs> But it's been, uh, it's been great to finally talk to you and I've had an insight of what you're talking about tonight. So I'm really excited uh, to be able to, to share uh, your insights uh, into um, uh, obviously your, your, your views and obviously looking specifically tonight at the mirrorless and LED lighting system, mirrorless cameras, I should say, and obviously the LED lighting systems. Uh, Terry, I've got the links to share with everybody about yourself that you've sent me over. So they'll be getting those through the chat panel uh, tonight as well. Um, but uh, I think you said that we're going to tell them a little bit about yourself in your presentation. Just remind me if that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically the, the presentation is, um, is brand new. I've, I've actually done the presentation today so it's 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 sort of there's an introduction about me um and then leading on to why i shoot mirrorless cameras and why i use led lighting with plenty of examples along the way so it's pretty much all contained within the presentation as we go perfect brilliant but right well we won't waste any time i'm going to hand you the screen and then let you know that we can see everything clearly so that's going to come over to you now i've just made you the presenter um, and just while we just get Terry's screen on live and online with us, I just wanted to remind you any questions that you have for Terry, please pop those through the question panel and we'll be sharing those with you. Uh, I'll be asking Terry where appropriate. And obviously we have allowed plenty of time at the end for questions. Terry, I've got you in full screen mode. I can see it clearly. Um, everything's looking to you, pal. So I'm going to go quiet and just interrupt with questions, but you feel free to stop me at any point and check if there are any. And it's all yours, bud. That's great. Thanks very much. So let's crack on. Let's get going with the presentation. So um, as we step through, there will be various bits of information. And basically, we, we, that's my tagline at the moment, shoot what you see. And it's very, it relates really to shooting with the EVF and also the LED lighting, which when you combine the two together, you can shoot exactly what you're seeing in the viewfinder. The guesswork. There's no work on now. What you see in the viewfinder is what your camera is going to record. So thank yous first of all. Thank you to the Photographer Academy for inviting me, in particular Jay and also Mark. Um, the societies for putting me forward for the webinar. And again, all the great people down there, Terry Collin, um, Rotolight, it's, it was um, one of my sponsors, Sony and also Photospeed. So who am I? Hopefully one or two people might already know me. Um, but my name's Terry Donnelly. Um, I'm an FRPS, FSWPP, FBPE, MPAGB, EFIAP. And I take pictures and that's basically how I'd sum myself up. My social media um, is all there. It's basically Terry Donnelly 01 on everything. I do run a Facebook group, which is Terry Donnelly Photo Training. And I've made that group specifically for people to come in and get a helping hand with the photography. I can nudge people one way or the other when they're posting, but it's a good self-help group as well. I've got some really, really good active people in there who are helping each other um, progress in the photography. So if you want to join that, please do. I'm working with Sony at the moment as an ambassador role. I'm also very proud to be a Rotolite Master of Light and also very proud to be an ambassador for Photo Speed. I will say, though, through the presentation, all the views I'm going to express are my own and don't necessarily represent any of the above companies. So I mentioned the um, fellowships before, which I've done. I've done one with the societies, one with the Royal Photographic Society. I've done one with the British Photographic Exhibitions, which some people may not be aware of, which is a, a cumulative um, Fellowship, which you can you can you can work towards through acceptances and awards in national exhibitions. Um, the EFIAP is an international sort of body, uh, FIAP, and that's an international award, or FIAP award for again, it's a cumulative number of acceptances and in international exhibitions. And the MPAGB is uh, the Masters with the Photographic Alliance of Great Britain, and um, that's their top level award as well. Also on the photography club scene, um, the Lancashire and Cheshire Photographic Union, I'm a listed lecturer, approved judge, and part of the mentoring team as well. So we actually mentor people to go for their distinction awards within the PAGB umbrella. 
and I'm also a PAGB listed judge, which is the highest level of judge in the in the UK in the non-professional world. As far as the societies are concerned, I'm their Median Documentary Photographer of the Year for 2016 and also their Fine Arts and Pictorial Photographer of the Year 2016. And that came from six nominations in different categories. I was second in a number of the other categories, which was a terrible place to be second, but at least these ones came through for me, which unfortunately wasn't the story the year before when I had, I think, had five nominations and I think four of them were seconds and one was third. So 2016 was a much, much better uh, result for me. International photography exhibitions I've exhibited in over 25 countries with over 230 international awards and 13 best in exhibition awards as well. Now, when you consider for these exhibitions, sometimes we'll have 12,000 plus entries from photographers all around the world uh, to get a best in exhibition is, 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 is something special really. So I'm very, very proud to have um, accumulated 13 of those. And this is just an example of, of what you end up with when you are involved in competition photography. You do end up with boxes and boxes and boxes of ribbons, medals, uh, glassware. But every single one of them is very special to me because you earn every single piece and, and every single award. Even if it's only a ribbon, you earn it because it's hard earned. About my commercial work, I actually shoot um, architecture for, for a living. And... I shoot hotels, construction sites, um, brochure work, that type of thing. So that, that's one arm of, of one of the income streams which we have from photography. And in, in today's photography world, you do need several income streams. It's very, very difficult to make a living just from one, one piece or one stream. I also shoot a lot of editorial work. Um, I do a lot of sports. I shoot at the top end in the Premier League, uh, for which media are accredited. I also do gymnastics, horse racing, um, and I particularly enjoy, not so, uh, the editorial work is great, but I really like the sponsor work as well. Sponsorship work is really, really good to have. So what type of photographer am I? Well, as we step through, it's, um, I shoot sports, PR, architectural, creative, landscape, fine art, portrait, media, I shoot all these different types, but to me, they're one and the same thing. It's all photography. And for many, many years, people have told me that to get really good at something, you've got to just shoot one genre and concentrate on it and do nothing else. But I've resisted that because I do enjoy shooting different genres of photography. And the best advice I can give anybody who's listening, if you enjoy any part of photography, just go and shoot it. Don't listen to other people. If you enjoy it, shoot it, because that's where your best work will come from. So during this um, presentation, I'm, I'm going to share some things with, with, with people who are online. I'm going to make them aware as well of certain things that perhaps they may not be aware of. And hopefully I'm going to excite them as well, because I'm really excited about the way photography is going in, in, in terms of kit and, and what it can achieve and do for us. Does gear matter? People will argue over this till they're blue in the face, um, but having the right gear really does matter it makes a huge difference to what you're doing it's got to be right for you you've got to be comfortable using the gear what, what you've got to hand if, if you're not if you've got any sort of uh, photographic equipment what you're not comfortable with get rid of it and buy something you are you, you need to be comfortable with what you're shooting and also it's got to be the right gear for the task in hand as well if you're favouring one piece of one camera, perhaps, and it's not quite right, if, if you go and shoot in sport and it's not capable of shooting high shutter speed um, or in, in low light, you know, you, you've got to think about all these things. The gear really, really is important. Mm. And I understand the concept of, you know, all the gear, no idea that if somebody's starting out in photography and they go and spend £10,000, it's not going to make them a £10,000 better photographer. But I would, I would, I would hasten to add that there's probably nobody listening now who's in that sort of category. And myself personally, I've probably only met two people who do fall into that in the last 18 months. So if you're here and listening to this, I, I think you really do care about your photography. And from that viewpoint, your gear does matter. It's got to be the right gear for you and it's got to be the right gear for the job. 
So when we look at this, this is the first front cover which I've had, uh, which was shot a few months ago, and uh, we were doing a, um, a behind the scenes uh, video for Rosalite. And again, we're talking about gear. I had to have gear which could complete this shoot. You don't need lots of gear, but you do need the right gear. And I actually shot that front cover with a Sony A9 with a 12 to 24 millimeter lens and one single rotor light Neo 2. So not lots of gear, but the right gear is the message I'm trying to get across. The gear is important. You need the gear that is going to give you the best images for your needs. And just a point on this as well, this is quite important this for me. Everything I speak about is from an informed point of view, based on experience and using the kit. I'm not going to speak from here on in about something what I've read online or I've heard somebody else talking about. This is all generated from me. And I, I, I shoot a lot, I shoot nearly every day. I've used a lot of camera equipment, a lot of different brands. So everything I'm saying is my own experience. Um, and that's what I'm going to share with you. So Sony Middleus and Rotolite LED Lighting is a complete what you see is what you get environment. So it's a wazzy wig, I think they call it in technical terms. Um, but it really is with, with the electronic viewfinder or if you're shooting from the rear screen on the Sony Middleus camera. And once you bring in the LED Rotolite and you're using that on, on continuous mode, what you see is exactly what you're going to get once you press that shutter. And I save an awful lot of time using this system because I don't chimp. I don't sit looking down at my screen wondering, oh, did the flash fire? Or is that overexposed? Or is it this? Or is it that? I can see it before I press the shutter. I can see exactly what I'm going to get. So mirrorless cameras, what are they? Well, as the name implies, it's, it's a camera without a mirror box and without the pentaprism. And you can see the size difference between the A7 R Mark II and uh, the Nikon D5. It's it's quite substantial. It's, it's a massive, massive difference in size. So why are they so different in size? If we take the DSLR in the middle of this slide, it's got the mirror, it's got the pentaprism, and the light comes in through the front of the camera. It hits the mirror, bounces up around the pentaprism and through the eyepiece. So when you go to take your picture, you hit your shutter, the mirror flips up, the curtains open on the sensor, exposed to the sensor. The curtains close, the mirror drops, and then you're good to go. Now, when we look at the mirrorless representation on the right hand side, we don't need the mirror and we don't need the pentaprism. So the form factor is much, much more compact and more smaller. If you look on the left hand side, the SLR, which is the, the film camera representation, you can see that it's pretty much the same as the DSLR. There's, the only difference really is that we've got a sensor in place instead of the film. And although the DSLR has come a long way and it's packed with electronics and very, very finely tuned, it is still that same original design which we used in film cameras many, many years ago. So there's always been a compromise for me between speed, quality and portability. And I've ended up carrying two systems around for a long, long time. I've always seen the benefits of using a mirrorless camera system, but I've always needed the high performance of a DSLR. So I've ended up with two camera systems, which isn't ideal because you end up, you've got different types of batteries, different types of battery chargers, um, different memory cards, different memory card readers, different file systems, and on and on it goes. So I've been shooting mirrorless since 2009. That's when I got my very, very first mirrorless camera. And I started off with a Panasonic GF1. And this was this was a brilliant camera in its day. It really was. I enjoyed shooting the GF1. It was uh, nice and compact. Um, got good good files out of it, and it was a great little camera. But time marches on, and that was eight years ago. I actually took up with a GF2 in 2010. I didn't enjoy that one as much as the GF1, but it was still it was still a good camera. In 2011, Nikon announced they were launching the One Series, the Nikon V1 and the J1. And I thought, well, this is going to be absolutely amazing now because I'm shooting Nikon already on the DSLR. I can combine that with the One Series. They were bringing out an adapter so I could fit the Nikon um, DSLR full-frame lenses onto the, onto the One Series. But unfortunately, 
for me, the, the, the sensor was just far, far too small in the one. And it didn't really give me the quality what I was looking for. So that camera didn't stay with me for very long. It got sold. I then came across Olympus in 2012. And the EM5 was, was a cracking little camera back then. Really was. Enjoyed using the EM5. Had its, had its limits, but on the whole, it, 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 was, it was very, very good. And all these cameras what I've used, they, they have served me very, very well in the day. 2014, I moved on to the EM1, and that was an improvement on the EM5. So, again, I really enjoyed using the EM1. That was a good camera. I jumped ship slightly. I tried the X-T1 in 2014, and I'm a person that I do have a certain amount of brand loyalty with, with, with brands what I shoot or what I use, but I don't have brand loyalty beyond common sense. If that if, if that makes sense to you, if I think something is better for me and it's going to improve what I'm doing on my photography, I'll actually I won't think twice about trying another brand out. Really won't. And um, everybody should be the same, really. Some people want to speak to now. They say, oh, I've shot this brand for the last 12 years or that brand for the last 10 years. And they're loyal, but it doesn't make any sense to me when when I speak to them and they tell me the problems they're having with different brands. So it's always worth considering just uh, just look around and see what's best for you because that's what's important in all of this. So the XT1 wasn't really for me for a number of reasons. So um, that one got sold pretty much uh, after I bought it. So right up to date, 2017. And it was probably nearly 12 months ago, I was approached by Sony to, to try out their, their range of uh, middleless cameras. And at first I was a bit hesitant and I thought, well, What's the point? You know, I'm shooting DSLR and I've got my middleless water use alongside that already. And each each promise of the next middleless camera being, you know, so fantastic hasn't really um, lived up to that. So reluctantly, I did try the, the camera. I got an A7R Mark II from Sony um, on a 16 to 35 mil lens. And I shot it the same day. And I was absolutely bowled over by the quality of it, by the focus and ability of it, and just everything about the camera. And forgive me for saying this, Jay, but when you look at the Sony camera, how gorgeous do they look? The, the design of them is just absolutely stunning. And um, the usability of them as well, the files from them, absolutely fantastic. So I'm now actually shooting a, a Sony A9 as well as my main camera. And I shoot the A9 pretty much for everything what I do. It's a very, very capable camera. <clears throat> so there we go, a little bit of a graphic as we move on. So I've always had a DSLR alongside a previous mirrorless camera. And probably you need to explain that a little bit more. Why the two camera systems compromise file quality and performance versus portability and features. And that's always been the issue for me. Always from even back in 2009, I could see the benefits of a mirrorless camera system against the DSLR, but the quality in, in terms of files, in terms of focus and ability, um, speed, it just wasn't there. So here's a, a quick um, quick comparison. The DSLR is big, we know that. Uh, the middleless is smaller. The DSLR is heavy. I actually go and visit a uh, physiotherapist once a month and I get my damaged shoulder put back in its socket because it keeps moving about. And that's all down to carrying heavy gear for many, many years. The mirrorless case is lighter. The DSLR is noisy. And even more noisy than I ever realised now when because I'm shooting with mirrorless pretty much 95% of the time. When I hear a DSLR going off, it's, it, it is, it's a lot of noise coming from it. Um, Top-end DSLRs, you've got to have a fixed screen. You're not allowed to have a uh, articulating screen. And I really enjoy an articulating screen. I shoot a lot from the back screen. And to be able to move that about is a really, really big deal for me. Um, but on the top end DSLRs, you can't have that. You can have it on an entry level, but not on the top end. The DSLRs have got an optical viewfinder. And again, they're very bright, um, they're good quality. But once the light starts dropping, um, you struggle a little bit in seeing what, what you're actually photographing. And I shoot in a lot of dark environments, not only in portraiture, but also in sport. So that's not ideal for me. The EVF 
is is much much better it, it gives a much much better representation of what you're photographing and I, I absolutely love the evf now when i go back to shooting an optical viewfinder it's oh, it, it just it's archaic it's terrible and the other big thing was the af micro adjust with this um carry on where you have to adjust your body into into your lenses to get the best uh, sharpness out of your lenses i've struggled with that i've always struggled with it i've paid money to have the body adjusted to the lenses professionally i've used um, third party software which i bought off the internet i've always had a problem with it if you tune the camera body into the lenses on the micro adjust and you shoot in a warm environment and perhaps you go to a cold environment it shifts again and really for me in 2017 for the money what we pay for top-end dslr equipment it should work straight out the box there should be none of that going on uh, the benefit with the mirrorless cameras is that they actually focus right onto the um, sensor so th there's no need to um, micro adjust them so that's brilliant moving on to sony mirrorless cameras the smaller totally silent not a noise out of them totally silent nothing at all the lighter the faster and they're a higher quality and again i'm speaking from experience now i've used a lot of camera equipment and the sony a9 i'm using at the moment is is more than a match for the um, nikon d5 which is i've shot extensively um so that's a big thing for me so now the mirrorless camera which i'm using can do anything i need it to do it can do sport portraiture wildlife and it's just a great, great, great solution. Ten top reasons to shoot with only mirrorless. Sensor size. Now this is important sensor size. And again, people will probably disagree with me. Um, but from me, from my point of view, this is what the sensor size is all about. In comparison to a four-third sensor, a full-frame sensor will receive four times the light. When I go out, and I've already mentioned that I can be shooting in a very, very dark environment, I'm, I'm hunting around for every piece of light that's available. Light is so important. Um, the full frame sensor receives four times as much light as the four thirds. That's just the physics of it. That's just the light transmission. That's the way it is. Also, there's a two times crop factor by using a small a four thirds sensor, well compared to um, a full frame sensor in a Sony mirrorless camera. People speak about this as well, the f-stop. Well, the f-stop is just an equation. So if you've got an f2.8 on a um, micro four thirds camera system, it's not the same as the f2.8 on a full frame camera. It doesn't receive as much light. All the f-stop is, is the focal length of the lens divided by the aperture diameter. And if you've got a smaller camera system, both them values become smaller. So the actual equation will still produce f2.8, but it is not the same as f2.8 on a full frame camera. It's totally different. And again, why is it important? Well, it does this. f2.8 on a full frame on the left hand side will give you a much shallower depth of field. And that's really important. If you want to distinguish your photographs from perhaps say somebody shooting a mobile phone, um, it's depth of field, depth of field you can bring into play and really knock that background out. On the right hand side, there's an F2.8 from a micro four thirds camera. And as you can see, the background, the frame was crunched right the way out the background. It's lost that separation and you tend to start to lose that professional look. Now, this young lady I photographed on the street and the lights behind her are actually cars and um, traffic lights and other things. But because I can shoot wide using the full frame, I'm completely knocking that background out. I've also lit it as well with a rotor light EOS, and we're going to see more about the rotor light in a, in a short while and the LED lighting. Once again, there's a cafe behind this young lady, and these lights are actually inside the cafe. But because we're shooting at a very uh, shallow depth of field, we're getting the, the bouquet lifting up. And it gives it adds another dimension to your photography and it will separate you away from other people once again we shot this young lady and there's a brick tunnel behind her so we needed a separation and we needed to modify that background and you're only going to be able to achieve that by using a, a narrow depth of field 
I've actually lit this one as well with a LED lighting. I've got a red gel in the background, which is just filling the shadow density up. And um, I've lit from the front with a Rotor Light Neo 2. And as you can see, it's given nice round catch lights in their eyes. And it's a beautiful soft light running down her face as well. Same again, shallow depth of field, and we're completely knocking out the cars in the background. There's actually a car park behind her on this shot, um, but we can't see the cars because of the narrow depth of field. This one again, we're shooting against the field. Narrow, narrow depth of field, nice and shallow. And again, we've lit with a Rotolite AOS this time, and it gives us a nice natural um, editorial type feel to the shot, totally isolating it from the background. So that narrow depth of field is really, really important to me. It may not be to some people, but to me, I, I think it's a massive thing. And out of everything, I think that being able to isolate your background is so, so important. Another thing I've noticed as well with narrow depth of field, you can actually you get improved focusing ability, especially in low light. And I'll quantify that a little bit further for you. This is the British Gymnastic Championships. And um, this lady is doing a double turn. And you can see the um, the way her legs have deformed, the muscles as she's spinning, and the, obviously the facial expression as well. But I've actually shot this at f1.4. I've shot it really nearly narrow. And I've done that because I'm very, very confident in the Sony A9 and its focus and ability. I know it'll lock on and it'll nail a shot for me. But what's happening is as well, the focus isn't having to hunt around. It's only going to operate within that narrow depth of field that that's its first point of call it's going to look there and find some contrast and lock on and give me the image also because i'm shooting in low light it's um obviously giving me the ability to raise the shutter speed and to shoot with a lower iso which also increases the quality of the file and it's an amazing system when you look at the the lights which are behind the the gymnast as well which could cause all sorts of trickery to the focusing system but it's absolutely, um, it's amazing, the focusing system. It's absolutely superb. Again, similar type of shot, just a bit further up on the next trampoline. Same again, high speed, um, f1.4. And the, the camera has absolutely nailed the, the focus on this chap. Second top reason to shoot, uh, Sony mirrorless. High quality EVF and rear screen. Now, when I say high quality, I don't mean good quality, I mean high quality. Sony are renowned for making PlayStations, all sorts of uh, imaging, um, imaging um, electronics, TVs, and they've got the, the in-house, they've just got the, um, they've got the ability, the know-how, they've got everything what they need to uh, give you an absolutely top product. Terry, I'm just going to jump in, mate. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, just thought there's a question that I hung on to and quite relevant now that you're on it. Yeah. Um, somebody's asked, well, a couple of people have asked now, what does EVF mean? Oh, sorry, I do beg your pardon. It's an electronic viewfinder. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So instead of having a optical viewfinder, which you look through on, on a traditional DSLR camera, we've got an electronic viewfinder in there. So when, when you look in there, you're actually seeing what the sensor's seeing. So that's why you can gauge your exposure and, and any adjustments what you make on your camera, absolutely spot on when you uh, look through the, the EVF. So that, that's what gives us the, what you see is what you get environment. And basically it's, it's, it was out on the beach now with the A7R Mark II and you can see the rear screen, high quality. And when I say high quality, it's you've got good color rendition, there's no smearing, it's sharp. You, you're seeing exactly what you're going to get into the sensor as you press the shutter and you end up with a shot like this. Um, weight and size, obviously that, that's quite apparent really, the, the, the size difference there um, makes a massive difference, especially when you're traveling. If you're going through an airport, we need smaller kit now and we need lighter kits as well because it's getting harder and harder to get kits on in your, in your hand luggage. Um, the pressure now and, and the challenge is that the, the you know the the airports oh they want everything in the hold but if you put it in the hold you never know when you're getting it back and if it's expensive camera equipment and you're flying somewhere specifically to shoot you want to keep it with you at all costs smaller camera as well it allows you to engage people more people are more relaxed to get photographed of a small camera 
And I know people sometimes are, are a bit concerned about getting challenged when they're photographing people on the street. But with a smaller camera, it's less, less likely. People are much less um, likely to approach you at all. If you get a big DSLR out with a big lens on the front, you're probably going to cause a little bit more attention and you are likely to get somebody asking what you're doing. Uh, silent shooting, number four. I, I choose a lot around animals, especially racehorses. The, and these horses are ready to go. They're f full of carbohydrates, they're full of energy. They haven't had a full run out that day. Um, so you've got to be very, very careful. And any noises on to walk can upset them. So we do have to be really careful. And silent shooting is a big bonus in that respect. As you can see with this horse, which reared shortly after the, the picture of me was taken. Not through my fault, by the way. It was a paramedic who dropped his bag, but you have to be careful. Again, shooting in the gymnastics, you're not normally allowed to take pictures before a, a gymnast or an athlete starts their routine because you, you can upset them, you can you can put them off. And if you do cause any issues in these environments, you likely are, are the fact you, you just get asked to leave. Um, there's, there's no argument, you know, you, as the photographer, you're there as an addition. And if you're causing any problems, they'll just ask you to leave the premises. Again, if you shoot weddings, you want a silent shutter. You don't want to be the person in the in the church when everybody's silent and you're there clicking away. Um, even DSLRs in quiet mode now make quite a lot of noise, especially in them environments. You don't want to be that person. If you shoot wildlife as well, um, went to Norway uh, last year, flew into Oslo. We had a three hour drive into the mountains and then we had an hour's trek up the mountainside to get in position before daylight to photograph these uh, golden eagles. And the challenge again is that your DSLR makes a noise and problem is these birds hear absolutely everything. So you end up in that position and you're scared to take a picture, which again is it's a bit insane really when you think about it, but being able to shoot totally, totally silent with a mirrorless camera is, is a massive bonus in that respect. Sensor technology, if you want a Sony sensor, if you want the laser Sony sensor, you have to have a, a Sony camera. Um, they will share some of their sensors once they've had, had enough competitive advantage, but one category of sensors is reserved purely for Sony cameras, unfortunately. So if you want the best sensors in the world, you have to buy a Sony camera. Articulating screen, I mentioned this earlier. I absolutely love shooting from the articulated screen. And why we can't have that on a top of the range DSLR camera, I will never understand. It's great for shooting onto the floor. You can put your camera right down on the ground uh, and, and, and actually line your shot up and take your shot from, the, from a, a kneeling position. You can also try different angles out. You can hold the camera up, point it down and still be able to frame up and take your shot. And you can hold it out as well. I mean, there's no way I'd be able to frame this up through an optical viewfinder. I, I, I do need to have an articulating rear screen to do that. Okay, number seven, third party lens adapters. You can actually fit um, Sony um, sorry, Canon and Nikon lenses onto your Sony body using one of these adapters, which aren't expensive. And I think that's a really, really great thing that Sony have allowed um, third party manufacturers to do. It makes a massive difference and you can fit your lenses on there. Um, so for me, because I'm a Nikon shooter, I've been shooting Nikon, I've got various Nikon lenses. I can actually adapt the lenses now and use them on my Sony camera as well. I still have all the benefits of the, the mirrorless system. And this was shot with a Nikon 400mm f2.8 with a cheap £30 adapter off eBay, a newer adapter. And there it is um, in the hide, fitted uh, onto the big lens there. Five-way in-body image stabilisation is my number eight uh, best tip for shooting mirrorless. And these work famously well. A number of different manufacturers have these and the, the, the Sony works um, really, really good. It's a fantastic system, allows you to shoot handheld really, really low down. And again, if you're using third party lenses, because it's the actual sensor that's stabilized, you can actually, whatever lens you've got on there, you can still benefit from the in body stabilization system. And I think this one was shot at about half a second. I've got the car blur and passed, but the rest of the fame is uh, nice and tight and sharp. Sony is a company, big company, absolutely huge. 
Um, I did read that they manufacture approximately 50% of the world's imaging sensors. 50% of the world's imaging sensors, that's just unreal. So if you're going to invest in a, in a system, you know, you need to know that that company's going to be around for a long time to uh, support your your investment. And the focus and capabilities on the new mirrorless cameras on the Sony's is um, second to none. Absolutely top, top end focus and system. The A9, which I shoot, has got 693 focus points covering 93% of the sensor. Just absolutely fabulous. You also have an option, which is iAuto Focus, which again is quite unique to the, the, the Sony mirrorless system. And it actually recognizes the human eye once activated and it puts a focus box on the eye. And as the head person's head moves left to right, the focus will jump to the eye, which is closest to the camera. And I shot this young chap. He was um, this guy's off the the Voice for Kids. He was one of Will I Am uh, team, and I photographed him. He's bouncing around on the stage and he's rapping away. And a normal focus would be bouncing off the microphone, off the hands, or trying to jump to the life that's behind them. But the I auto focus is so so intelligent and so accurate. It just locked straight on and I stayed with them all the way. And this is shot at f2.8, this one. Again, shooting at f1.4, really, really accurate focusing system. When, it, when I used to shoot at 1.4 on the DSLR, I used to struggle a lot ensuring I had good good focus. And even to the point where I'd take a number of shots and move forward and back slightly just to try and make sure I got a critically sharp um, focus on the eye. With, with Middleless cameras now with the new focusing systems and the eye also focus, even at f1.4, it's absolutely on the money every single time you shoot. And the focus, and these are just some examples of um, of gymnastics which are photographed, low light conditions, um, not a, not a lot of light about there. These these are pushing ISO maybe four thousand, five thousand. These pictures, but the focus and really really. Really tight. Again, with a, an owl flying towards me, backlit, focusing no problem, absolutely nailed. So let's have a little look at LED and then we're going to look how the mirrorless and the LED lights work together. Um, I'm very proud to say I'm a Rotolite Master of Light, which is um, which is the name which Rotolite have, have, have given to me. And there's, there's a number, I think there's about nine or ten. And then um, we've got some of some of the best photographers and videographers in the world who actually wrote to like Master of Light. So I am very, very honored to have that title. And Rotolite Light itself, it's a pioneer in British technology company specializing in creating award-winning LED lighting products for photographers and filmmakers. It's won all sorts of awards. It really has. They're picking awards up fairly every week. I look and they've won something else. And what I love about it, it's a family business and they continually invest in and um, bringing out these new products. And it, it's actually run by a, a guy called Rod Gammons. And Rod is so innovative and so tuned into what he's doing. And um, it's just a fabulous company to be involved with, it really is. So this is the type of lights what they make. This is the the, the, the front side of the, the LED lamps. And by the way, how cool is that Rotolite logo? It's just awesome. It's just it's just as cool as the, the, the Sony. The Sony looks, they, they work so well together. So when we look at the front of the lights, this, this is what you see, it's an array of LEDs and they give out a beautiful soft light, very, very usable light straight out of the light. So there's no real need to, to add modifiers or soft boxes or anything like this. As the light comes off the lamp, it's, it's good to go. This is the light I use the most, which is a Rotolite Neo 2. And although it's a continuous LED light, it's also a flash as well, so it's unique. It's the only one in the world, as far as I'm aware. And this light will also high-speed sync at up to one eight thousandth of a second. It's got a dedicated trigger, which is a rotor light trigger uh, by Ellen Chrome. And it, each light of the, of the new series now has built in an Ellen Chrome Skyport receiver actually built into the light, which is rock-solid triggering. Um, and you can use that with existing Allen Chrome triggers. If you want the full version, you need to uh, buy the, the rotor light light there. And this is the back of the light, how they look, and you can dial in the, the power, how bright you want it to be. And quite uniquely, you can also change the color temperature right in the light, and the LEDs will change color to give you an exact Kelvin what you dial in. 
And this is uh, one shoot which he did with the, the rotor lights. It's, uh, it was a Spitfire aircraft. And we lit it from the back and we filled the room with some smoke to get separation. Um, we lit the pilot from the right-hand side. And I used the light on the left-hand side of the aircraft as well, just as a bit of fill to bring a bit of detail out on the wing. And then we ended up with this shot, which is quite atmospheric. Just looking on the back of the camera on this one, this is a mobile phone picture, so it's not quite as sharp as some of the ones we've showed previously. But it's just demonstrating it's the what you see is what you get environment. And because we've lit with LED lights, because we're looking through on the rear screen, you can actually see what the photographer is actually going to record on the camera. This is a, sh a picture of shot down on the beach again, um, Sony A9 with the 12 to 24 millimeter lens. And we actually used LED lights as well to, uh, to light this young lady. And I think I've got behind the scenes shot coming up now. So this is on the series. We've used the Rosalight AOS this time. Once again, the Sony A9 with the 70 to 200 millimeter G-Master lens. And just when you look on the back of the camera, what I'm actually seeing in the viewfinder is the exact picture what I'm going to record. It just makes it so much easier. I'm not running around wondering whether the light flashed or if the exposure is wrong and, you know, pressing the replay button by the seconds and dialing back and forth. While, while somebody's chimping around on the camera, I've shot another five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pictures. It just makes your work so much easier and it allows you to concentrate more as well. I'm not worrying about lighting or anything at this point. All I'm thinking about is composition. Another example. Uh, using the Rosalite AOS again on the behind the scenes shot there. And I'm just balancing up for the um, the ambient light. And I think I shot this at about two thousandths of a second just to kill the ambient down. And I've just introduced the, the Rosalite AOS just to light our model's face. And as you can see, the quality of the light straight out of, the, out, out of the lamps with no modification. It's absolutely stunning, absolutely beautiful light. And again, another example of that. This one again, shooting very, very shallow depth of field, using the rotor light LED lamp to come in on light our model. It just gives you a very professional looking image without having to put a lot of effort into what you're doing. Have you got any questions, Jay? Or we have, pal. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we've got we've got loads. So I was kind of just. Oh, yeah. Leaving you, yeah, go through your flow sort of thing before I, uh, rather than okay. interrupt. Well, I can go through a few more slides, or if there's anything, pe you know, which is relevant, uh, please do. Um, uh, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll butt in, but the gen there seems to be just quite a lot of general stuff with regards now to both mirrorless shooting and obviously LED lighting. So, um, yeah, no, if you crack on with what you've got, but and I think we'll just hit this, the questions full on when you're ready for them. Okay, cool. Well, th this is another example of a picture. I'll, I'll share the breakdown with this. This was actually shot with uh, with three LED lights. And the challenge was here was to um, bring the environment into the shot. So this was towards the end of a shoot. So we'd, we'd, we'd lost most of the ambient, but we'd still had some of that blue hanging around in the, in the sky. So what we decided to do, we shot, stood our model in, in front of the, or in between the two lamps. And I've actually put an LED lamp shining back towards the green, the green um, structure behind it. it. Looks like a, I don't know, looks like some sort of kiosk. Um, so we're actually lighting that with a light which is off to the right hand side of the camera behind the wall. And I've actually got a separation light which is which is pointing towards the back of the model, which is just separating that out from the, the dark background. And then we've got a third LED light on the camera right, which is illuminating our model's face. So very, very easy to do. Takes literally seconds to set up because we can see the light. We can see what we're doing. I'm not running around with, with a light meter and testing flashes. Um, it's a very, very, very quick and intuitive way to work. That's why I love the system so much. These are some of the pictures which I've shot with, um, with mirrorless cameras. It's um, very, very easy, uh, very simple to gauge the exposure straight into the back of the camera. And a lot of these pictures, you'll, you'll only get one, one opportunity to get them. So, you know, that makes a massive difference. Again, we shot this model um, using two LED lights this time. I've used one with a, a blue filter on, a blue gel on, 
just to fill the shadow density up and give us a little bit more interest on the background. And then we've got one LED off the camera left, just lighting our model. And again, it's unmodified, it's straight out of the lamp. Two lights again, same two lights. And we've got the, the light with the blue gel on the floor behind our model. And again, I've, I've, I've exposed this for the, the light coming through the windows. The idea was, was to keep the blue from the windows and then light our model separately. Three lights on this one. Again, three three um, Neo 2s, um, one camera right, one camera left. One Neo 2 is behind our model, uh, firing towards us just to give us some separation and a bit of a halo, a ring light around our model. Same setup again, three lights. Just very, very, very easy way to, um, to light, really. And a lot of people, what I know anyway, I'd say 90 to 95 percent of them, aren't really up to speed with using flash, they struggle with flash and invariably they get so fed up with it and then they just they just fire and flash without really controlling the light and getting the picture what they want. The continuous LED light, it's it's a different world, it really is. It's so, so much easier to um to achieve what the, the look what you're trying to get. So again, this is a single Neo 2, which is uh, high up above um the camera just um just pointing 45 degree down towards our model and again I've exposed for the ambient and introduced the light to uh, light our model. Same again, nice and simple, easy way to work. I've exposed for the ambient coming through the, the clock structure behind the model and we're just using one Neo 2 to light our model again up high at a 45 degree angle down. Same setup again. This time, this is a single LED light firing through um, through a, um, a scrim, just to give it a larger light source, just to really, really soften the light up and have it wrap around um, our lady there, who's uh, on the phone calling someone. Hope it's not ET. And again, different examples of lights. One single light on this time for the LED, Sony A9 with the um, 85 mil. And this is the same setup we showed earlier with the four lights on the aircraft, but we've just come in and um, shot a different type of picture, really. And you should aim to do this once you've set your lights up. Um, the great thing about the LED lights, once they're set up, the, the, they're actually there. So you can move around, um, you can change angles with your camera, try different types of shots, um, shoot portrait mode, landscape mode, and, and really just experiment and get, get a different type of shot for, for each, each one what you take. Some more gymnastic uh, pictures here. And again, we explained this one earlier, F1.4 on the Sony A9, um, 85 millimeter. And with introducing the rotor light um, AOS into the shot, just to cast some uh, beautiful soft light onto our model's face. This one we showed earlier. This one's actually in studio now. And very, very easy uh, type of lights to um, uh, pictures to, to get. Because once again, you're actually seeing in the viewfinder the exact picture what you're going to take. There's no guesswork as there is uh, with flash. You're not walking back and forth. You're not metering. You're not taking your picture and thinking, oh, that's a bit too bright or that's not bright enough or I don't like the shadows on a face. You can actually direct your model to get the shadow or the look what you want. Again, single Neo 2, rotor light, LED on this shot. And that nice um, shallow depth of field, just giving the separation in the background, but also that lovely leading as well on the right hand side. So if you ever shoot any form of editorial, you'll be used to leaving a lot of negative space somewhere in the frame. Um, and that, that's there so people can overlay text or do whichever they, they want to do at a later date. Again, nice shallow depth of field, makes the world a difference to your, to your photography. Nice and wide this time with um, 14 to 24 millimeter. Different type of shot, different feel to it. Really, really wide, accentuating our model's legs and giving a little, little bit of an attitude look. And 
And again, on this series, nice narrow depth of field. The fantastic focus and ability of the Sony A9 combined with the LED lights makes this type of shot so easy to do. And just finally, some wildlife shots. Um, not LED based this this time, but again, mirrorless cameras have come on so much now. They really are an advanced camera system, and they do give the best of the DSLRs a, a run for the money. And in my in my own personal opinion, I, I think that, that they are performed the best of the DSLRs in many many respects. I'm much more comfortable with what I'm shooting now with this new setup with mirrorless and LED, and. Uh, I'm very, very comfortable with my photography where it is at the moment. I'm very, very happy with it. Again, landscapes, these type of pictures, you can you can see the picture before you press the shutter. It makes a massive, massive difference. If you use some filters as well, you can focus through the filters and you can get a good feel and cause the the, the the actual viewfinder on the rear screen or through the electronic viewfinder, it'll show the exposure what you're going to get. Even if it's on long exposure, it'll give you an indication of how it's going to look. And I think that's the end of my pictures, Jay. So shall we do some um, some questions if you've got some handy? Absolutely, pal. And before we get into that, obviously, what a great insight. So we really appreciate that, Terry, in case I forget to do it after, because obviously we need to eat a buckle in, because I've got a few questions for you, mate. So, okay. <laughs> so they're not in any particular order, pal. I think it's just as easy if I sort of read down them. Uh, that way I won't miss any, so we make sure to get everybody's questions answered. Yeah. I thought this one was quite a nice uh, question. It came in really early, um, Terry. Um, obviously, talking about the mirrorless systems, everybody's quite familiar, obviously, with DSLRs, and that was that you've given us a fantastic insight into into why you've switched or why you use them in, in conjunction with your DSLR today. With regards to, obviously, the, uh, you know, the back of the screen, and this is the main question. Um, yeah. Do the mirrorless cameras still have the same functionality such as histograms? Do you find that across uh, the ranges? Because I know obviously you're an, uh, an excellent person, Nikon, and also Fuji user. But basically, are they the same really, but just smaller and more contact lighter and giving you the, the same sort of usage? Does that make sense? Um, I think so. The, the, the question over the histograms confused me slightly. You, you do, you can get on these cameras a full readout of histograms, um, RGB histograms. Everything is available, and it's all on the options. It's just a rock of a switch, and it'll change the information what it's actually presenting to you. So, um, every piece of information you'd ever want to know is available just just by rocking the back switch. Um, that's, they just that's, smaller kind of, camera? that's what I meant, sorry, really, is I think the question was, um, yeah. you know, we're seeing that they're smaller. Are we losing things because we're going for something smaller and lighter? But I guess what I needed you to not, confirm is no. Not in my opinion. I think we're gaining. I think we're absolutely gaining so much. I mean, one, one of the things what Sony are doing for the industry, and if anybody ever never ever wants to change from DSLR and they want to stay with DSLR for the rest of their life, right. they should thank Sony because... DSLR companies now are trying to introduce into their camera bodies what Sony have already brought out last year. They're trying to keep up. So Sony are actually dragging the industry along. They're actually driving uh, the development in a lot of things at the moment. Um, and the question, has it gone smaller? Are we losing things? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think we're gaining. The quality is improving. The functionality is improving. And one of the great things, again, and, and this, this this applies to Rosalize as well as well as Sony. They actually listen to people. They're, they're very very um, customer focused, and they do listen. I mean, if you if you go onto YouTube or if you go onto the Facebook page for Rosalize, the managing directors there he he answer your questions. Um, and and I, I I think that's so refreshing in today's world. They really do, because it's too easy for companies now to give their client base what they want to give them, as opposed to giving them what the client base want and what they're looking to do. And I think that's true um, in, in the Sony cameras as well as the Rosa lights. It's, um, they are trying to give you much, much, much more than what you had before. And if you bear in mind, this is all brand new technology as well. The E-mount on the Sony was, you know, I think they started developing in 2011, 2012. And that's a very, very new technology in there. And it's actually jam-packed with all the latest electronics available. Same for the Rosa lights. It's a, they're designing all the time, they're innovating all the time, and it's new technology, 
it's got all the latest uh, components, the latest technology in there, latest designs. We're getting so much more from these cameras now. I've got a bit of a two-part question here for you, Terry. I think, well, it's the same question, but I think they hit the enter button while they were typing it. Um, obviously, we were talking a lot about depth of field and one of the things that you love about your camera. Uh, and obviously yeah. in the um, in the electronic viewfinder, and of course we did. I don't know if you mentioned it, but some of the other questions that came in because they could see obviously the the normal viewfinders there as well uh, for yeah. us old school uh, people who can't get our heads around uh, the electronic screens. Even though I'm getting better with them. Um, do the, the the reflection in the you know you were talking about uh, you, you said a lot about you you photograph what you see. Um, when yeah. you're talking about like the shallow depth of field, do you see that in the electronic viewfinder? Do you see that absolutely. The viewfinder? You do, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You see the exact picture in terms of exposure, colour, depth of field, everything. Which you don't get on an optical viewfinder. You have to um you have to press a button to get it the to get the lens to uh, stop down so you can see the depth of field. Well, on an electronic down. viewfinder, you get exactly <laughs> what you what you're going to get. So you've just answered the second part of my question. Does it do okay. it, or do you have to press the big button like you do on the DSLR? So no. Perfect. No. Absolutely brilliant. Exactly, exactly what, what, what you see is what, what you'll get. Brilliant. This, uh, I've got a question related directly to your uh, sports photography. Um, okay. Do you have a preferred uh, focus system for shooting the, the sport and capturing it? Do you prefer a certain focus mode? What, what, what's your sort of um, it depends what I'm shooting with and what the conditions are, really. Preferred, uh, if you had my choice, it'd be um, on the A9, it'd be centre point, and I'd have it on um, on, on high, high tracking. You, you can actually dial in how how strong the tracking is on, on the A9, how, how much you want it to lock on what once you focus. So if, if I focus onto a player, I can tell it how much I want it to follow. So if another player comes in, cross of, in front of that player, the focus won't jump off. So that that be my preferred one. It'd be, it'd be centre point focusing, but with um, with a high degree of tracking involved in that. Brilliant. Uh, oh, I thought this was a really interesting question, actually. Yeah. Uh, I think it was when you were talking, it, it came in when we were talking about, obviously, I think it was when you were talking about using, you know, your uh, the Sony allows you to use your, your Nikon and your Canon lenses. Um, yeah. well, and we've got a few more questions about that in a second. But... Um, Dirt spots, are they as common with the mirrorless systems as they are with DSLRs? <laughs> I've heard this a few times. Not in my experience, no. Excellent. No, okay. not in my experience. Brilliant. And also, um, I'll, I'll just add on to that, Jay, it's a lot easier to clean a sensor on a mirrorless camera than it is on a DSLR. Excellent. Um, I can never, ever get dust out of a DSLR. I can get it off the sensor, but it stays in there. Once that mirror starts flapping about, it starts throwing throwing dust around again and back back on the centre. On the middle, there's nothing in there. You can literally just take your lens off um, and, and the sensor's right in front of you. You can get very, very easy access to it. It's easy to clean. Brilliant. Uh, and the next question you actually already answered and it came in, <laughs> ironically, I left it because it reminded me, when just as this question came in, you put yeah. the slide up about using your Nikon and Canon lenses and the question was, will a Sony A9 take my uh, Nikon lenses? And it, it was just, amazing timing it was just one of those like and your yeah, slide it, then appeared so obviously you've answered that one already so perfect yeah uh, it will take them with an appropriate adapter i'm not the most techie in the world teddy you clearly yeah. know your stuff so i'll read i'll read this to you as i see it um so you mentioned digital st stabilization um which is what had me thinking um of looking at the olympus say for a a holiday slash uh, going away type of camera. Looking on Wex, there's no obvious mention of this on the Sony. Is that just on certain ranges? Does that make sense? So a digital digital stabilization, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I think it's referring to the in-body stabilization system on the on the sensor. Um, I can't I can't really comment on on what the person's seen, but my understanding is that the uh, in-body image stabilization system is on all, all the alpha range. Everyone I've used has got, has got it, so maybe it's just an omission, but it's certainly worth checking before um, the, you know, the person uh, goes further with it. But again, depends what the model. If they know what the model is, maybe I'll be able to, um, to give you a bit more information on that. 
Okay, pal. And again, these are the things that obviously I'm sure that you can find out directly from either Sony themselves, yeah. but any good also camera supplier, even if it is the likes of Wex, they should have a support team available. Oh, they will, they will, they will. Uh, yeah, to and, to, and to bear in mind as well, I'm, I'm actually not a digital imaging expert. That's the guys who go and know everything about every single camera or Sony do. I'm only speaking from a user point of view. Yeah, yeah. So um, I can only really speak on what I've shot because otherwise I'm just going to do what anybody else is going to do and go and read it on Wex website or on the Sony um, own website. Perfect. Well, the camera uh, review will be able to give them an answer for that, obviously. Okay, so I've got another techie one. And again, excuse me if I don't read it correctly. I'm using yeah. a Nikon um, VRLL, if that's an abbreviation, I'm obviously haven't seen it, lens with my Sony IS stabilization. Yeah. Does it give me five or six stops of addictive stabilize, additive stabilization? Does that mean anything to you, Barry? I'm, uh, uh, sorry, Terry, I might have read it wrong. I, 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 I sort of know what the question is, but again, I couldn't answer that. Okay. It's, um, it's, no, that, that, that is I, one for somebody yeah. who's, who's, that's for a real techie person who's used that equipment. Um, oh, brilliant. All I can say is that I think the question is with the, um, the IS on the lens, will the IS on the lens work with the Sony? And the answer to that is, I would say, is no. Okay, perfect, mate. But to be you. honest, on a, on a long lens, it's. it's you would only really use image stabilization on a lens or in the body at a very, very slow shutter speed. Just there's no other yeah. reason why you'd use it. So yeah, perfect. Well, okay, we've got a bunch now. This is obviously where we train tech because we've gone, we've moved on to LED lighting now, and we've got a load range on these as well. They're probably going to be more about going back to the cameras in a second, mate. Um, okay. The rotor light. Um, how waterproof? How weatherproof is it for shooting outside, basically weddings and so on? Um, I've shot mine outside. I hope Rod isn't listening. But I've, <laughs> I've shot my Neo 2 in the rain. It's been absolutely soaked. Um, the day IOS has been outside, as the Innova Pro has as well. Uh, we shot at RAF Cosford a few weeks ago. It was absolutely horrible, fine rain. They were out for hours. Um, so they worked. But what the official lineup is, is again, that, that's a question to go directly to Rotolite, really, because they, they have the all the different um, precious standard ratings on the equipment so they they'll have done tests for, for how waterproof they are accessible so, you know, we, we get the same questions about all the all the um the adding chrome stuff that we use outside and you know officially yeah. you know you have you should be cautious they suppose they're saying that they're uh what's the term um it's light rain, isn't it? It's not even light rain, you know. They're they're shower, yeah, they they're shower proof, proof, isn't it? Waterproof or waterproof, and but yeah, the, but the answer just from me, from a user point of view, um, all the lights I've got, I've had a good soaking, and uh, touch wood, they're, they're still going strong. Well, that leads on to the next one. When you're saying all the lights that you've got, what's the typical size of your uh, LED uh, kit? Then how many lights are we are we, are we normally travelling with for a job, Terry? Um, eighty-five percent of the time, I'll take a single Neo two light with me. That's for eighty-five percent of the time because that allows me for a very small bag to have the Sony A nine, two lenses, and a Neo two and a transmitter, and that can for for a PR job that that can pretty much do everything. Um, if I'm going for a big job, I'm lighting an aircraft. Obviously, you know you you need to turn up with a uh, considerably more light. Um, but generally, that 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 would be an EO2. If we're doing something a little bit more special and I've got an assistant, I'll, I'll take the EOS with me. Um, but generally, just just a single EO2 is all I need. Brilliant. Uh, I've got a couple of really good questions here. Oh, I'll get this one out of the way first. Uh, the lights themselves, uh, battery or mains powered, or can they be both? They can be both. They Excellent. can be both. R Rotor lights uh, produce. Um, they've actually tied up with a company. And they actually supply um, AA batteries, um, which are Braveheart. I can't think of the name. PowerX, PowerX are the manufacturer, but the, the brand of Braveheart for Rosa light. But it's a high quality light, so you need to use high quality batteries. Um, My next question was, and you've answered the first part of then, with regards okay. to shooting with batteries, what's the yeah. kind of shooting life uh, with those, pal? Oh, you, well, you wouldn't believe. Neo 2. 
It's um, with six AA batteries, lithium ion batteries, rechargeable batteries, the, the ones I mentioned, you will get 85,000 full power flashes out of one charge. Brilliant. There we go. 85,000 compared to a speed light where you might get 200, 250. Brilliant. Oh, that reminds me. That was a really good point you just mentioned, speed light. This was the question that I talked about that came through um, to you uh, earlier today when we were talking this morning. Uh, so yeah. we specifically asked about uh, the Sony uh, cameras and um, using uh, studio flash uh, triggers. And we were also had a question about what speed lights we can use with them. So I remember to write that down and bring it in. So it was a good, you just prompted that. I would have forgotten about it otherwise. Um, okay. but the question was, so everybody knows, sorry, was uh, with the Sony camera specifically, uh, can we use a studio flash um, hot shoe mounted triggers with them? So that's the sort of question one. So I'll leave that one yeah. to start with. Absolutely, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah it's, got, it's got a standard um, hot shoe on the top. So yeah, studio flash uh, triggers are fine with the Sony. Brilliant. And then the second part of the question, obviously, that I mentioned earlier was, are we restricted to what speed lights you can use? And you said, well, with the exception of some of the earlier uh, cameras, wasn't it, that had a slightly different hot shoe, but now all of the new Sony yeah. have the new standard hot shoe. Yeah. So speed it's lights. got a universal hot shoe on the Sony now on the on the Alpha range, so you can use any. I, I've used a lot of different speed lights on them. I've used um, different brand ones. Um, Third party brand as well, like the Young Nuo, they, they all fire fine. There's Brilliant. no problem with them. Brilliant. So it just prompted me there, and it's written down in front of me as well, but I would have ignored it. Um, right. That's uh, okay. Um, how did you balance your ambient light with the rotor light flash? How? Yeah. Oh, okay. In, in terms of um, when I come to look at a scene, I've got I've got to evaluate in my mind what's more important. If it's a single person. If it's a model, I'll go. I'll go wide open. I'll go at f one point four. So that's my starting point. I then need to balance and control the ambient with the shutter speed. So then I bring my shutter speed into play. If I'm slightly out of range, maybe I'll adjust the like the ISO to bring the total exposure up or down to bring it into a workable range for me. Um, and then I'll, I'll just by eye really. I'm not. I'm not meeting. It. I'm just looking for the feel and the look what I want. I'll control the ambient and then I'll introduce the LED light and dial the power up or down to, to light the model um, appropriately. Brilliant. Uh, this came through a couple of times, Terry, which uh, I thought it might do. How powerful in are they LED lights in comparison to, you know, normal studio flash? A studio flash? Um, a studio flash is a bit open ended, really, isn't it? Are we talking 250 watt seconds, 500? Well, that's fair. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just a studio, a studio flashlight has, has got a lot of power. But things to bear in mind is, and again, uh, on YouTube, um, the managing director, Rod, has, has made a series of videos answering a lot of questions. Um, but the, the thing to bear in mind is, if you if you compare a, um, a studio light or a speed light, the first thing you do with the lighthouse at them light is to throw half of it away. You'll either bounce it off the ceiling or you'll be putting it through a big modifier and you, you, you lose so much of the power instantly. The light straight out of the rotor lights is fully usable as it comes out. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely different way of thinking, really. Um, and if you're not using flash, if you're using continuous, obviously, it's lower power because um, they do flash. I believe it's um, at 150% um, more power on flash from on continuous mode with the rotor lights. But again, um, for that sort of question, ask rotor lights on YouTube. All the answers are there. Okay. Uh, what's the sort of optimal distance with the LED lighting, mate, before you start losing, you know, before you get in drop off? Again, it depends. depends it depends on. on the conditions. It just all depends on... Um, depends on the level of ambience, depends on what ISO you're using, what aperture. It's so many variations on, on what you're using. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a difficult question to answer that. Perfect. And just a few of those we've already asked. Uh, okay. Do you by any chance know the release date of the Rater Light Neo 2, but specifically for the Fuji X system? So. I don't, unfortunately. I know Rod's working on it, and I, I know he's quite quite far down the line with it. I don't think it's going to be long. But again, 
it's they're a great company to socialize you know if you fire a question in they'll just tell you straight away um where they're up to but they are working on it and i'm pretty sure it's pretty close brilliant um okay so i think you've already mentioned this but i'll just in case i haven't asked it properly um the practicality of using the rotor light on location compared to a quadra obviously light as uh, well not only not not light but I'm guessing weight is obviously a, a huge uh, another factor in, into doing it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And obviously working with the, even with the quadras, I know they're pretty powerful because we use them here. But again, you know, you're yeah. working at you're working at distances where the LED should come in. And again, you're going to see, like you said, you're going to see what you can shoot. And and so. Yeah. The, and it's your style of shooting as well. I mean, that, that, when I'm shooting on location, I'm working mainly to balance ambience up, and that's how I'm using the light. Um, there's a lot of power in a quadra. Um, but it's it's it's, it's a di different type of system again, so it all depends what 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 you need, what you're looking for. And as I mentioned on the cameras earlier, you have to get the equipment to suit the shoot what you're doing. So if if your game is that you need a lot of high power and you need to deliver it in a fast burst, then you'd go for a quadra kit. If you're doing what I do and you're blending the ambience and you want um, usable light straight off the lamps with um, minimal. Um, port, you know, a lot of portability, not a lot of stuff to carry around. And you can work quickly. The rotor lights the one to go for. Brilliant. Uh, speaking of that, uh, I think you just touched on it. Um, most of the time, are you using the, the the bare light out of the rotor light, or do you use any kind of modifiers and light modifiers with them at all? Um, pretty much just um, the light straight off the off the lamps as they are. I've I've got one set of barn doors which you use for the the small. Um, for the small Neo and on the Innova Pro, which you use, I've got a grid which you usually take off um, on a set of barn doors on that, but not using any soft boxes or anything like that. If, if I do need to soften any light off for any reason, like the lady I showed before in the World War II um, dress, that was a bit of a different type of shoe because I had to light through a window. So we used a big scrim outside the window, a big um, diffuser and then I lit the diffuser which gave a glow which came through the window but that was more about not being able to get the light in where it needed it to be more than modifying the light so uh, the answer to the question is it's, it's pretty much as they come off the lamps bro um in your opinion i think you actually had answered this right at the beginning of your presentation uh, but do you find with the mirrorless cameras there's a there's there is less that can go wrong with them um less i can go wrong uh, in terms of uh, well, yeah, but there's, there's less isn't there because there's no mirror um and there's no pencil prism and there's a lot less work and parts in there so from that point of view um common sense would say yeah there's, there's less to break on them um i think that's what the question is getting at really yeah um, yeah. yeah yeah so from that point of view i'd i'd be less concerned on putting a lot of a lot of uh, shutter counts on a mirrorless from what it would on a, an actual mechanical um, DSLR type uh, setup. Do you find with the uh, EVF system, does it cause more camera shake? And do you find yourself using a tripod more? No. No. I've never, I, I don't find it using, no, I don't find it suffering from that at all. Brilliant. Um... Uh, oh, I had a load of questions here about using, uh, you know, uh, Nikon and Canon lenses with them. Do you find that by using, um, uh, say, a Nikon lens with an adapter that you lose any image quality at all? No, not at all. Perfect. And do you, I think it was in your, I can't remember what it was, but do you have, a, uh, do you recommend the best adapter for Nikon lenses? Um, well, again, I've only used the manual focus adapter, which was a £30 one off eBay. And one one of the things with mirrorless cameras as well, the the, the actual manual focus on this is, is so easy on them. You know, you can it'll, it'll give you a visual indication of what's in focus and what's not. Um, the adapter for the Nikon to the E mount is about three hundred and forty pounds or something like that, and I think that's the Metabones one. But I've not actually shot that, but I believe it it, it does work quite well. Well, uh, do you know what the high speed sync capability of the A a9 is question mark yeah the a9 sorry high speed sync is a uh, one eight thousandths of a second as far as i'm aware oh brilliant there you go mm. uh what's the difference between the neo 2 and the aos the aos the aos is, a, is physically a bigger light right it, it, it's a larger light and it, it uses a different battery source as well it uses the uh, the v-lock battery 
um, which is more powerful and it's a brighter light and it delivers a stronger flash as well. Okay. Um, I can we touched on this, but uh, obviously I think you've answered it, but I, I'll answer it again because somebody asked me that uh, I, maybe I didn't ask it in full their question earlier. It was again about the powerfulness of the LED lights. Um, it, you know, how, how powerful are they in bright sunlight? Do you still get, you know, a good result from them? I think you showed quite a few examples of that though today, Terry. In bright sunlight? Um... I don't think anything's uh, bright and bright sunlight, to be fair. And I, th I think the question is, why do you want to shoot in bright sunlight? If I go anywhere where it's really, really bright, the first thing I do is to look for a shaded area because the light is so harsh and it's difficult to shoot in really bright sunlight. It's a horrible, sharp light. Um, you've got to be very careful in it. So um, if the question is more about overpower and the sun, well, there's not, if you want to do that type of shot, and you want to be out of the shade, then you, you, you need a really, really powerful light for that, uh, 500 watt seconds upwards. So again, using the right um, equipment for what, what your intention is. But I'm more than happy. I mean, I, I was shooting last week uh, when I was down on the soft, south coast. That was a really, really bright sunny day, and I was shooting at one o'clock in the afternoon. But I had no problems actually shot in the shade. And... Um, and, and lit, lit my model from from the shaded area. So for that type of shoot, what I'm doing, it, it, the rosa lights are ideal. Um, I think, and then, and then I had this come back through, and I think it was when I asked you the question the first time round about, obviously, yeah. you know, we, we, when we started talking about the powers of them. Um, somebody mentioned, and I think it's just because of the, the shots that you've used to illustrate tonight, but obviously we saw the Spitfire shot. Obviously, it was quite yeah. a dark hangar. Um, and then I think we saw the series of shots that you did for the the cover uh, and your you know the, your behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so there yeah. were a few people have mentioned that obviously we can see the strength of the lights because we were in dark environments. Uh, so I think that that's what's led to the sort of more darker environments than normal. But obviously I think the key point and then but we did see then uh, the model stuff and, and correct me if I'm answering your question for you and I'm wrong. But we yeah. did see then the stuff you know where we had the the, the blonde haired model you know, in, in the sort of uh, the lighter space and we could clearly see the effect that the lights had on it. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the answer to the question, I, it's all coming back to power, isn't it? That's what it, they all seem to be asking the question from. But um, yeah, but it's, 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 it's very, um, the, the question on power, uh, one of the models which I showed, which was the, the lady with um, sort of with the field behind, I don't know if you remember that one. Yeah. Um, and then we, we had showed the setup shot as well. That was actually shot at one two thousandths of a second. So when people are saying they can see how dark the environment was, I've created that darkness with that high shutter speed. That's took the ambient down. So you can't really just look at the picture and say, well, that was a dark area or this was dark because I'm controlling the ambient. That's the whole point of it is. I'm actually controlling the ambient to where I want it to be. And then I introduced the LED light to light the model. Brilliant. Uh, okay, this is going back to the camera now. I think, oh, yeah. uh, actually, before we get back to the camera, we've only got a couple left now, Terry, mate. Um, okay. <laughs> we have got there. Uh, going, I, I know you mentioned it earlier, but I think somebody missed it. Uh, we were talking about okay. the uh, battery life with the AAs on the road to light. Uh, can mm. you just remind how many, there, there's two parts to this question. Um, the one was how good is the battery life shots per battery? I know you mentioned it, but they must have missed it. Yeah, how good is the battery life? Yeah, you know, um, you know, you said um, you said how long the batteries lasted, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, it's eighty-five thousand full power flashes from a single charge of six double A's on the Neo Two, and I believe the continuous light output is for about three hours on full. Ah, sorry, I've misread the question completely. Okay. And uh, so Chris has just has put the point in. He was actually referring to the battery life in the camera rather than the lights. What's the battery? Oh, in the camera. Oh, yeah, the, the, battery, the battery life on the, in the camera is, is just absolutely phenomenal. It's uh, you're looking two and a half thousand, three thousand shots with full auto focus, full auto exposure running. The the battery, the Z series batteries in these new um, Sony cameras now is just amazing. Absolutely brilliant. Well, the second part to the first question was how long do the yeah. batteries normally last if you're using continuous light? So I don't know if you've got a gauge on that. Yes, I believe it's about three hours. But again, um, ask Rosalite. 
these these are all spec questions, which um, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Just what it was just from your own experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they, do, they do last a long, long time, long time. Back to the camera then. Um, how and I think you've talked about it, touched on it briefly, but how good are the mirrorless cameras, or specifically, obviously yours, uh, in low light situations like dark churches and so on? Yeah, brilliant on low light. The, the focusing system on the the A9 camera that I'm shooting is uh, is phenomenal. In low light as well, it's um, it's excellent at picking out. Excellent. It's um, it locks on fast. It's accurate focusing as well. It you know it locks on and when when you shoot and you review your images, they they, they are bang on. It's um, if you get a chance to shoot one of these cameras um, and you've not used one before, you, you will be so impressed with them. It's um, it, it's it's another level level up again. It's just, it's a huge step forward in focusing on mirrorless cameras. Um, brilliant. Uh, right, I've got one last question, and then I've got some feedback for you, Pat. Um, okay. The first, the question is: Have you got any plans on class uh, workshops for your road to light, uh, road to light at all? Yeah, we, we have. A, I've stayed away from workshops a little bit just at the moment. There's a there's a lot of workshops around, and I'll only run a workshop, Jay, if I can help somebody, because I don't do them just to generate income. I, I'll run a workshop if I can genuinely help somebody and you know um teach them something and, and get them where they need to be so just for the moment of have withheld from doing workshops because with them being so um so many of them about but yeah we are we are planning to do some uh, probably in the next couple of months but the way to find out off that is off my website because that's where they'll they'll go on first Perfect. um we, we are going around the country at the moment I'm doing quite a lot with Sony UK so we are at different points around the country and again the place to see that is either in my photography group or or on my website and um that there's a good opportunity to get hold of the cameras and have a good play about with them as well because we have full support with sony they have all the cameras there different lenses um especially if you can get on a workshop we've done quite some really exciting workshops with sony over the last three or four months but workshop specific yes we will be doing some um probably going to be back in the January now because we've got a very busy schedule in December. Um, we're flat out in January uh, with the convention. So probably back in the January, we'll be looking at, at, at doing some um, some workshops. Perfect. Uh, guys, I'm just going to finish off tonight now with the feedback and a few things that I want to share with Terry. And a quick, we'll have a quick chat, obviously, about what he's doing at the convention as well before we finish. So I do appreciate your questions, but we've run way over and I've got a few more things that obviously we need to share share with you now. Uh, but Terry, the first thing that I wanted to share with you was um, about eight people have already told me tonight that they're going to uh, uh, jump ship, thanks to you. So that's, you, you know, well done, mate, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you know, Jay? It, it, it's it's a good choice. I, I'm a sharing person. I do like to share stuff, and I'm encouraged when people do look at other things because the days of just going to your camera store now and going in and saying, "Oh, I want a camera," and the guy behind the counter saying, "Oh, do you want Nikon or do you want Canon?" Them days have gone. There's so much choice now, yeah. and it's an it's an it's it's a it's an investment what we make. You know, it's not cheap photography, it's an investment. And we need to be using the good kit and, and, and seeing what's, what's, what's out there. So that's good for people to change. And I mean, we, we, we've seen um, so many people uh, actually come into the Sony mirrorless system now and they are enjoying it. It's, it's, it's a step up for them. No longer worrying about, as I said before, camera settings or will this flash fire, will that flash fire? They're thinking now about the photography thinking about composition absolutely and i mean we've had obviously you know tonight obviously you know as you mentioned quite early on obviously we know you're a sony ambassador we obviously know that you're a master of light for road to light but what's great terry is that you know right at the beginning and as i know already from talking to you that you've you know you've you've decided that the sony was right for you it's the right camera now for you and you've been through the fuji you've tried the olympus you've done the nikon you know it's that's that's the cases and and you know obviously there are a lot there has been a lot of fuji users online with us tonight and obviously we know that it's just, uh, a very popular camera and there was you know yeah it's been that you know they, they they all do similar things yes we know they all do similar things but everything moves on and and, and i for one um you know we, we don't use mirrorless here i think i've had this conversation with you terry we've got an x pro one that we've had for a while that is 
and I, I, I don't mean to belittle it, it was one of those ones we liked, but we just, it never yeah. sort of turned into anything for us. But recently we've been talking to the likes of yourself, Robert Pugh does a lot of work for us and he was Olympus up until recently. He's moved mm -hmm. to Sony, um, you yeah. know, uh, and, it's, and it's opened, um, you know, we're just opening our eyes up to what's coming. It is coming. It's definitely a big part of the future of photography, the mirrorless systems. And, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's coming. I mean, it's, Sony are now, um, I'm led to believe, uh, the second largest supplier of full frame cameras. Um, so if you think about that, the second largest supplier of full frame cameras. Times, so are, the, times are changing. They've actually outstripped one of the major DSLR yeah. brands already and they're chasing down the other one. And it will come because they're innovating and they're giving people what they want. And when people see, when we do a demonstration of the I also focus, Jay, you want to see people can't believe just how accurate and how easy it is to shoot. Um, you know, it really is. It's a revelation. It's um, it, it's a great brand, and they they, they are, in my opinion, um, doing great things for photography. There's a there's a lovely there's a lovely quote here in the in the feedback. Um, from uh, from Richard, who says, um, I, I converted from DSLR to uh, mirror, mirrorless this year. It's uh, it's one of the best things. I've, it, it's done in. It's one of the best things I've ever done, and it's reinvigorated my photography. Um, yeah, absolutely. But you know, that's a great word. That's a great word, reinvigorated. And I've heard, that's... you know, I've heard that a lot. You know, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, we've chatted today. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a good. You know, Kevin Mullins is a good friend of ours, and and, I, and I've chatted to him long and about this. You know, and he's a he is a Fuji man, um, but when he switched to to Fuji for his weddings, you know, he's he's saying I'm a documentary photographer. I've got two cameras on my back. I can do a mm. full day, and it isn't killing me. You know, um, yeah. and, and we get that. I love to travel, but I got fed up of traveling with all my kit. You know, uh, and so I'm ready now to look at what I am going to convert to, because I am at that stage. I don't want to carry my big kit around with me anymore. No. Um, you know, because so I'm, I'm not getting choice. any younger me. <laughs> no, so none of us are. And, and the, weight, the weight is a huge factor. And it, even if you're just going out socially to take some pictures, it spoils your day lumping around a big bag full of heavy gear. You know, you have to... I agree totally, totally. Right. Um, I just before we're not going anywhere just yet because we need to talk about you at the convention before we do finish okay. up tonight. Uh, but I just before I forget, in case I forget, I really, really want to thank you, you know, for everything that you know, you've shared with us tonight. There's loads. Oh, of, you know what, Jay? It's, it's been an absolute. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And really, are so thanks very much. Loads of uh, praise and feedback, and thanking you for your insights. And that after yeah. I had the sneak peek this afternoon, I knew that it was going to be uh, going to crack. But I am gonna, uh, I'm gonna bring you back, Terry. I know we've talked about it. One of the things, guys, that we wanted to look at tonight, and we knew we didn't have time, was Terry was going to have a look at some of his uh, uh, his fellowship panel uh, with us and share, you know, the sorts and processes behind it. But we we realised very early on that we weren't going to get it covered tonight. Well, it wasn't what we initially planned. Uh, but I have invited Terry to come back in the new year. I know he's got a busy January, but as soon as I can get him a bit of spare time, we're going to have a look at that. And I think that'll be really informative. And I think that would be we're, awesome. Yeah, we're really looking forward to that. Um, so that's brilliant. So just before I forget, in case I forget, because I'm terrible at it, thank you. Thank you. And that's not just from me. Well, it is from me uh, and, of course, <laughs> uh, the friends of the societies, but also everybody who's online with us. Thank you.